I'm Larry Walther and this is PrinciplesOfAccounting.com Chapter 3. In this particular module we will be looking at the periodicity assumption and its accounting implications. This module dovetails with the previous module where we talked about how accounting was primarily based upon measurement triggers that are based on transactions and events. We'll now begin to understand income measurement better as we move forward and consider the periodicity assumption. The periodicity assumption holds that business activity can be divided into specific measurement intervals or periods of time. Obviously business activity is an ongoing process, uh, but we for accounting purposes divide it into periods such as months or quarters or years. In this particular illustration I'm showing how this tube is time going on, transactions and events flowing through the tube, but we need to cut off and look at segments of that particular tube such as a quarterly period. April 1 through June 30th in this particular case. A calendar year is simply a way of describing an accounting period that's one year long and it runs from January 1 through December 31. Many businesses, however, don't follow a calendar year convention. They instead follow a fiscal year. It does not correspond to the calendar year. It may follow a natural business cycle. For example, uh, retailers often end their year on January 31, so they have a February 1 through January 31 business cycle so that they can capture holiday sales and returns to get a complete picture of the accounting activity for that particular cycle of time. The periodicity assumption becomes challenging when you start dividing the life cycle of the business into smaller and smaller intervals or measurement segments. The more narrowly defined a reporting period, the more challenging it becomes to capture and measure business activities. As you have more and more periods, there's more and more ongoing transactions that need to be divided or allocated between those reporting periods. If we think about uh, dividing revenues and expenses into these measurement intervals, the challenge has become clear. Consider a software company that perhaps sells a product for $25,000 in year one, but agrees to provide free updates and service for years two and three. Well, the question is very simply, how much revenue is attributable to year one, and how much to year two, and how much to year three? That's quite a challenge when there's not a, a, a clear, definite allocation that is called for in the particular circumstances. And so accountants have a number of models and rules and methods to deal with these and many other situations. First and foremost, though, we say that we use an accrual basis of accounting. That means that we measure revenues as earned and expenses as incurred. And the accounting implications are significant. If we report only at the end of a process rather than at the end of a period, a measurement would be easy. If we took the software company that reported income for a three-year period, that would be easy to say we earned $25,000 over the three years. The challenge is deciding how much is earned year by year. And so why not wait until the end of an accounting process before we measure and report? It's very simple. Investors and creditors can't wait that long for information. They need it sooner so that they can decide whether to make additional capital allocations or perhaps withdraw capital from a business. Timeliness becomes very important in accountability. Uh, so the accountant's job is a significant job as it's very important that they understand the rules, principles, practices, and procedures that result in the allocation of revenues to individual time periods and expenses to individual time periods. And so the next two modules are absolutely critical. We're going to define revenue recognition principles and expense recognition principles, and they will be foundational for your continuing study of accounting.